welcome everybody into the room tonight. Coop, what's going on, man? Busy week in hip hop, man. How you doing? Western highly favored. Peace to all. Yes, yes, man. I mean, we're gonna go ahead and just get into it while everybody's getting in the group. And um, I mean, how you think? What did you think about that versus last night uh, with Gucci and Jeezy? I think the petty level was high by Gucci. <laughs> I think I think Jeezy won. I'm gonna tell you why I think Jeezy won though. Okay. Because my biggest my biggest takeaway of the evening, at least musically, was that Jeezy has made classics that everybody in the nation knows, and a lot of those records that Gucci played last night that I knew, I found myself asking myself, how well do they know that record in Brooklyn? Chicago. But was that LA. the point, though? I think that, you know, everybody coming into the room, I, mean, I want y'all to... Were there better songs either, I mean, were there, what, did he have better songs? It was closer than I thought it would be, but also, too, I mean, <clears throat> I think Jeezy may have had more missteps than anybody that's done the verses thus far, and I think he still won, too. We got a lot of people right, jumping into the room right now, man. Uh, we got Gucci, we got Jeezy. We got uh, the tension was thick as fuck. Jacob says he got snowman. Uh, PK said WAP. Uh, for the people who are voting Jeezy, for the people who are uh, people that are voting Jeezy, put a snowman emoji in there. For the people that are voting Gucci, go ahead and put that snow cone, or not the snow cone, the ice cream cone emoji in there. Uh, but what were you saying? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, man. We just got a lot of people in the room right now. I mean, what I was saying was was that it was closer than what I thought overall. Uh, Jeezy has more classics. I think his classics have aged better. They don't fit. How about this? Here's a better way of saying it. His classics feel more just hip-hop classic-like at this point and not regional classic-like at this point. Well, see, I disagree with you in the sense where, you know, um, I feel like I personally think Gucci won, actually. Uh, a lot of people got the snowman emojis in there. This is the reason why I think Gucci won. And this was a different versus than what we're used to, right? They kept billing this as something that was about Atlanta, right? This is a win for Atlanta. Right. And so I felt like the street records was supposed to be what was what. Uh, I could understand, like, on the nationwide level, a lot of the stuff that uh, Jeezy was playing was more nationwide recognizable but Gucci was playing more of the local hits. And Gucci stayed away from a lot of his big records because he was keeping his streak. And he spent like three or four records just dissing Jeezy in his face. Um, I, For me, I'm going to be honest. Go ahead. No, no, no. I want you to finish. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm going to be honest. The diss records took me out of it. And I feel like when the disc records come into play, that person kind of automatically wins, man. I mean, if we're talking about wins and losses, like, I didn't even care about the uh, Jeezy records that were being played after the disc records was play being played because it was getting real. And it was like the street shit, I think, in a matchup like that wins because this was about two trap rap legends in Atlanta. You know what I mean? This was more about a local battle as opposed to a nationwide battle. It was at Magic City. It was at the scene of the origins of trap music in that way. And it was almost like a building block situation. You know what I mean? So like the mainstream records that the you know rest of the nation knows, I don't think we're that important in this. Seeing it all wasn't important to me. I mean, if that's not important, then we could have just did that for the A. I you know, feel like... So that's, so that's not true, Mike. I mean, that's not true. Like, we can't take the nation out of it, because if that's the truth, we could have just made that in Atlanta thing and got that popping down here. So it's like, so that's not true for one. But I want to finish by unpacking the last the, the last thought that I had that I really didn't get to finish. Yeah, go for it. Like, like, I don't think anybody had as many missteps as Jeezy and still won and or like, like at best, Mike, I'll give you a tie and I only give you a tie because everything that you just said from the perspective of who they are, uh, how they got their reputation and what it is in a battle, everything that you said is very valid. And I hadn't thought about it uh, in depth from that perspective. So uh, those are all the student observations. And so the best I would give Gucci after that is a tie, but I don't think anybody had the missteps that Jeezy had. The only thing that I heard off of Trapper Die 2 
was uh, lose my mind. He didn't play my hood. I mean, he didn't. Did he play bang? Did I miss that? Did he play bang? No, 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 no. And you know, I, I don't. I think Gucci left out a lot of his catalog too. I don't know, man. I just don't feel like Gucci was there to win a versus. Also, too, I realized too that like I realized how many Jeezy verses the Jeezy's done on other people's shit that are pretty dope that maybe he could have used too. Like I'm gonna tell you something I thought that would have been a nice little sneaker that he could have used was uh, his verse on um, "Real as It Gets" off the Blueprint Three. He could have. He could have. I think that uh, a lot of the recent stuff that Gucci has going on, like I'm surprised that he didn't play the mulatto joint, you know, when she redid Freaky Girl and stuff like that. Um, you know, because Gucci has a lot with a lot of current artists, right? And he kind of just spread it around. And yeah, I think both of them could have used some help in the track selection altogether. Well, and, and also, too, it's like, you know, it's like he was obviously making it a point to be like, like I mean, you've seen him on the gram all week. So, I mean, he was obviously being uh, the instigator of the two in the situation. But, I mean, how did, how did he look at the end of the day to you? Like, I mean, what's your perspective? Based on how it ended, what's your perspective, too? Based on what Jeezy said. And Jeezy... You want to know my real perspective? Hold, hold on, hold on. And Jeezy took the best shot of the night with the whole real estate remark, Mike, because... Because it makes you think it's like, you know, he kept talking about his jewelry and he kept talking about his outfit. And then Jeezy hit him with the real estate remark. And I'm like, that's the type of blow you can't come back from based on everything that he just said. Because you've already framed it when you talked about your jewels and the 10K for the outfit. So when Jeezy hit him with that, it's like for me, there was no real coming back from that. And, and that was the quote unquote actual like ether moment of the back and forth. And for me, the fact that Jeezy did very little talking and took the biggest shot to me also stood out to me. As in, like, you know, say less, do more. My takeaway as far as, like, you know, how, uh, I guess, how Gucci looked at looked at the end of the day. For me, I'm going to be honest. I feel like Gucci got paid to do this. Um, it didn't seem like he really wanted to be there. Huh? I was thinking the other way around. No, 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 no. Look, who had the album coming out at midnight? You know, let's let's be real. Who really benefited the most from this? Honestly, if we're talking about on a promo level, Jeezy did. And when Jeezy okay. and T.I. was supposed to be doing this, they didn't get the response from the people that they wanted, so they had to switch it up. And I remember Gucci putting out, like, three weeks ago, he tweeted out, only way I'm doing the verses is if they pay me a million dollars. I mean, that's, I mean, that's actually like a good thing that they stopped the GZTI thing only from the perspective that that lets you know that the streets still like, like have like a voice in hip hop. The streets kind of put that on hold. And it's like, no, 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 no. That ain't really who we want to hear Jeezy with. Like it wasn't a disrespect to Tip type of thing, of course, because Tip was a superior MC than both of these guys. So, well, why don't you think the TI thing happened then? I mean, because honestly, let's be real. We're, we, we had a show last week. And this ain't even a knock on T.I. as a rapper or anything, but we had a show last week and we didn't even mention it. You know what I'm saying? And it didn't become a real story to get real traction until Gucci's name got, you know, put into the fold. Like, people weren't really interested in the T.I. and Jeezy matchup like that. I mean, one thing, like, T.I. has been floated around with a couple people now, so I guess there could be some just kind of, uh, you know, selling wolf tickets aspect to it. But I think it really just does have to do with, like, the streets saying, like, no, nah, like, we really want to hear Jeezy and Gucci. Like, y'all put that together. Like, like it was kind of one of those things where the streets is like, no, 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 talk, show me what type of, like, clout you really got with this and, like, put, put that together, you know? Do you think the T.I. and Jeezy would have been a better matchup? Um, I mean, just based on what you saw last night? You, I mean, I would imagine that Jeezy would have used exactly. different songs. Okay, okay, because, okay, because of, like, the animus tone that uh -huh. Gucci said... It made this verse is hard to enjoy to a degree. Really? You know, it, yeah. I feel different because you know I think the I mean, love fest like, and like, stuff of like, verses like, are I'm, cool. I'm I'm, I'm, say, I'm saying to a degree only from the perspective of it's like it's hard to enjoy some of the records in the back and forth when you can hear <laughs> how Gucci placing his records in the Y and it's like okay like he's just like you know. He's just going to go in, and he's taking it so seriously, not sitting down, the whole thing. And what I'm saying is, is that the vibe that Gucci kind of created 
and the animus nature of it, like did like hinder it from a from from a slight perspective of enjoyability. You weren't in, able to enjoy these classics from both of these artists as much. Like, are we I'm getting wrong. to a place? <laughs> Because you found yourself more concerned with what he was saying and the fact that he kept talking about his suit and the fact that he kept calling out Jeezy's outfit. Like, like you really weren't concerned as, as you have been in, in the past verses with really, like, actually appreciating and enjoying the classic music and doing the tally up like a, like a Snoop and DMX was. Like, Snoop and DMX was really fun. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. Yes, I didn't even know what round we were on, maybe because it was a lot of stuff going on and it was tough to tally. I was yeah. early. I yeah, I lost track. But, you know, honestly, I think it was a change of pace to actually have two artists that really didn't fuck with each other like that to do a versus because we've been singing such a, a love fest, which is cool. We love love fest. We love people showing unity. But at the same time, hip hop is aggressive. And are we getting to a place in hip hop where the aggressive nature is being shunned upon and people can't enjoy the music? when there is aggression in the building because that's real life and they do have a real situation and the fact that they set this up they should have known that things like this were going to possibly be a thing i mean mike you know i feel i hate that happy shit so i don't mind a little inner city angst you know what i'm saying like like i don't mind any of that at all for me on a personal level when, and a lot of the times when i speak on here it's like when i speak for me i try to make sure that i say that i speak for me but most of the time i try to speak from an objective perspective so it's like for somebody else watching it that's what i'm really trying to say overall okay I've hindered it from that perspective um this is still a battle i'm, I'm a, so i'm gonna submit something to you you know um I've been on the thread with a couple of the homies from the South Side since the battle started last night. As a matter of fact, I'm the one that started. I mean, we're on the thread together all the time, but I'm the one that got it cracking last night. About about 8.15, I was like, about that time. Right, right. You know, my people was like turned up. And I mean, but we was talking about it today. And it's like, it's almost like Swiss and Timbaland took their hands off of it, Mike. Like, you know what I mean? They kind of did it and put it together. But it's like, you know, they didn't. They didn't really get involved, and I thought it was, like, real political because it's, like, this was obviously the most street-oriented versus. And yeah. it's, like, it was it was the least promoted by them personally, I think. Yeah. And it's, like, where are they? And, and, and it's, like, you know, dude, and we on the thread. And I, I mean, and I'm clowning, Mike. I ain't even gonna lie. I'm, like, yeah, these some political-ass niggas at this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I think that some of the artists are kind of taking it in their own hands anyway. Obviously, the backing of versus and Swiss and Tim or whatever they do and the deals with Apple, all that st stuff was still in the play. I mean, hell, you had Stacey Abrams doing the intro, so obviously there are other forces involved. But, um, I mean, I found it interesting, and somebody said in the uh, comments, and we got a lot of comments, so we're going to get to the comments, but yeah, y'all keep going. Um, Rick Ross called out T.I., and it's funny T.I. so quick to respond to everybody, but he didn't say anything in response to Ross. <clears throat> I actually thought to myself, for all the stuff that Jeezy missed, like for all the opportunities that Jeezy missed and seeing how he's had a catalog run now on the verses, and Ross has had a catalog ver uh, run on the verses now, and they are contemporaries and once were adversaries and now have made music together. I'm more interested in hearing that because I think that's more of a fair match because... Because if 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 Ti does go versus Rick Ross in a, in a, in, a, in a versus, it's like Ross kind of has the caveat built in that it's like he already played twenty joints, you know. So I want to see Ti against somebody fresh, but Ross got enough. There's to there's Ross. nobody else out there for Ti. Honestly, I uh, I mean, because Fifty said he would do right. one with Game, so that's probably gonna happen. I would like to see Fifty in Game. I think Game's catalog <laughs> stretches more. I, I know we talk about Game's catalog being super underrated, so I don't yeah. think that's a good matchup for 50, nostalgically maybe, but when you factor in everything, I don't know. It's going to be tough. But who I else think, is I out there for T.I.? Well, well, 50's caveat was that Game couldn't play any records with 50 on it, so that that's takes how, uh, no, that takes how we do. And, um, Hate it or love it. Uh, hate it or love it. Off the table, right? That's pretty much it, right? Dreams it is the best song the game has on that project to me. No, I think I think put you on the game. Okay. Put you on the game for me, or um, Church for Thugs. Ooh, Just Blaze. 
Church yo, Thugs. yo, we recently <laughs> posted that um, Cameron freestyle that he did over uh, over Dreams on Rap City, according to hip hop. Yo, that beat yeah, was crazy, no, man. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I'm not gonna lie, Mike. You know, it's like I watch, I watch a lot of the stuff that we post. It's like I don't watch a lot of the old freestyles because I can remember some of them. I'm like, no, 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 whatever. But I watch it out. I remember that. That one. shit was yeah. crazy. Yo, Sean yeah. Davis says Lil Wayne's out there for Ti. Ti, I don't want that That's either. Nothing. That's the thing. Ti doesn't have anybody out there. He got to take Ross, and Ross might hit him with he joints that he didn't even play in the two chain. Wingstop, fat boy, nigga, ten piece. <laughs> and you know, me personally, I think album for album, and we've talked about this before, album for album, I think T.I. might have a better catalog than Wayne, but where Wayne gets him is the features and the mixtapes. And at that point, when you factor in those, it's really tough, man. I mean, it really you is. Album, hold on, you said album for album? I think album for album, I think that T.I. might have a better catalog than Wayne. When you talk about you know, I'm serious to trap music, to urban legend, to King, and, you know, Paper Trail. His five strongest ones, I think, are stronger than Wayne's five strongest albums. But if we factor in mixtapes and we factor in features, man, I mean. So, so, but I, <clears throat> that's where the mixtape becomes such a big thing. Because I was about to actually say, I know we're going to talk about, you know, because Jeezy did drop yesterday. And so I know we're going to get back into like. Well, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I'm sorry. Week. I think we might have breaking news. I'm going to check this. Doc says this on the Versus page that Wayne and T.I. are next. While you're talking, I'm going to check that out. Let's fact check this real quick. I was, I was actually thinking while you were talking, like you were listing off uh, T.I.'s albums. I was actually thinking to myself, like. Album wise, they're very, very close in comparability, though. Like their best five albums, if you were to sit their best five albums like side by side, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, like, like T.I.'s best album is trap music, right? To me, yes. Yes. Wayne's best album is the Carter, too, right? <laughs> yeah, to me. We're talking opinion at this point. Some would say Carter 3, right? But some for T.I. would say King. I think if you put Carter right, three versus right. King, so, so, I think that's very that's comparable cool. too. But that's what I'm saying. So like those are their two best albums in most people's eyes, right? Those are those are those are those are comparable. That's very they are. comparable. Is that not very comparable? Because it's like when when I said it, it's like because I'm gonna tell you what, it's like I actually like the Carter two more than trap music, Mike, but I don't know if it's better. I think I'm the opposite. I, I like trap music more than the Carter 2, but I don't know if it's better. I feel you. I'm, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Because Wayne is fitting ridiculously crazy on, you want to know what, Mike? Like, actually, when, remember when I was talking about Conway and the last time I saw an MC just, like, go crazy and spit on an album? Yeah. Like, the whole way the Carter 2 might be the last time I heard it happen for an extended period of time the way Conway just did it because he went crazy on that album I don't care what anybody says or like how like I know, I know there's a legion of heads that feel a certain type of way about Wayne where they think he's the greatest of all time I'm not in that legion but I'm not in the legion of people either that think like he sucks like he was the right. best rapper on the planet for a couple of years well this is the thing too I mean we got two different styles and I know a lot of people sometimes say you can't compare certain people with different styles we got one rapper that is very punchline heavy and you got the other rapper that doesn't do punchlines at all but they're still peers right and yeah T.I. is not a punchline rapper at all he doesn't give you metaphors or anything um, but I think where it becomes unbalanced is when we get into Wayne's features, right? And when we get into Wayne's mixtape stuff and the cult following that it has. As much as I love Down With The King from T.I., his mixtape game wasn't a cult following thing like Wayne's was. You know what I mean? And like you said, their catalogs are comparable. I think the tiebreaker definitely goes to Wayne in that situation. So uh, that's what. I, so that was one of the things that I wanted to talk about with Jeezy. Actually, was the fact that Jeezy is one of the few guys that, in his prime, had a very big mixtape and, and public following, a la Wayne. Yeah. And, and and there's something to be said for that because I found myself as a fan, like I was like, okay, like play some more Trapper Die Two shit, like play some more Trapper Die shit. Yeah. 
Like I wasn't even thinking about the album stuff. Like after, like after, because I mean, I'm, so I will give you this. Gucci took like the first three, four rounds, probably. Yeah. Like out outside of, I think whenever whenever Jeezy played standing ovation, that was the first round he won, in my opinion. <laughs> See, I think Jeezy, I think Jeezy, Wayne, and look, we'll say Fifty, and I might be forgetting some people. Uh, let me know. But I think that they're the guys that have more of a mixtape following than a lot of their hardcore records. I would say Big Crit's one of those, too, where their mixtapes are held so high and they actually have a cult following when it comes to their mixtape material. And, yeah, there's a lot of things that Jeezy could have done. He could have just went mixtape Jeezy. And that was my thing with Jeezy and, um, and T.I. See, I didn't realize how much of... Jeezy's mixtape stuff might have been nationwide bangers too. And I thought that's where T.I. might have fell in trouble with Jeezy. And I thought that would have been interesting. I actually think that the Jeezy and T.I. would have been more interesting than this one was. Because this was, like you said, this is a little bit more animus. And I don't feel like Gucci really was there to win a versus, for real. It didn't feel that way. That's nah. what I mean. So it was kind of hard to enjoy because it, it is still a battle format. And it's like, and so here's the thing. And so I'm going to explain this. And I feel like I've explained this three or four times on these podcasts before. The battle was set up to take the problems that were going on in the street and harness them and channel them into something productive where a clear winner was selected. The whole yeah. point of the battle in rap is to prevent the violence and the animosity in the street from occurring and channeling it into something positive. Yeah, that's so, like, real. I'm going to keep on reiterating like, the fundamental rules and basis of what hip-hop is supposed to be at the end of the day. And that's what I mean about, for some people, might not have been as enjoyable as in the heads may have looked at it. It's like, okay, fam, we get you, but you're here. But you're here, you're right. Stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That's all I'm submitting. No, yeah. I feel that because, you know, if you weren't going to – participate in it in the way it's supposed to be participated in you shouldn't have come right. and that's why i that's why i feel like my takeaway that's why my takeaway is he got paid i mean mike it's been a long time i mean if either one of them really wanted to take it to the streets again it would really be in the streets again right? yeah, yeah, yeah yeah like really like really after all this time if i mean even if you don't fuck with them or like each other you know what i'm saying well let me ask you this who do you think is really out there for T.I. Do you think we're going to see T.I. and Ross next? Um, no, I mean, the, Wayne, the, the, Wayne, the Wayne thing is what, is what I'm looking at, too. I mean, I would just, I mean, I mean, who, the, the real question is, is who, who, who's got, who, who's ready for Ross? Because Ross got, I mean, Mike, I can think of 10 to 15 Ross records he didn't play that he can win with. That he didn't play. So I can see the T.I. Wayne thing being, you know, uh, more fun. More, uh, I don't know. Like you know, I I hate. To say I think it, honestly, Jay Ross, the person Ross that's out there for Ross is Drake. Really, if we're being honest. Ooh, I think Ross is gonna beat Drake if that happens. I think uh, so too. But you know, I think I said last week that I I got Future beating Drake. So I mean, but you know, a lot of people disagree with that. But I just I mean, Ross has already had a versus too, so maybe we need to let some things and some people pan out and see how their verses go, and then kind of you know. Well, Ross is them. ready. I mean, he called out Ti, so it's like, and Ti honestly was one of the first people who was inserting himself into the situation, and he declined Buster Rhymes. You know what I'm saying? And the Jeezy thing was set up. Whatever happened there, you know, didn't happen. Uh, people are saying Wayne and Eminem. Let's just keep it real. Eminem's catalog ain't strong enough. And I'm not even a Wayne fan like that. What you gonna do? Play the real Slim Shady? Here we go. I mean, really. This isn't this isn't eight mile. This isn't a rap battle. Spaghetti, spaghetti, whatever, you know. But <laughs> But anyway. No no, 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 Mike. Do what you usually do when we talk about Eminem. I'm gonna let you finish. Go ahead. I mean, Eminem's catalog is suspect. I mean, for anybody out there, Eminem's catalog is suspect. Name 20 joints for real, for real. That we could go top to bottom, face to face with any hip hop artist. Y'all saw these verses. Y'all want to hit a real Slim Shady, really? In those going back and forth. But anyway, I think that. T.I. and Wayne could be interesting, but T.I.'s really got to select his stuff very well. 
Um, and Wayne does too. And see, that's probably well, that would probably be one of Wayne's biggest pitfalls is the fact that he has so much. You know what I'm saying? And he might pick some records that might not get the reaction that he's looking for. You know, he might pick some. 500 degrees type stuff just to do it for nostalgia but with T.I. I think we know what we're going to hear and so that might be the advantage that T.I. would have in that Wayne matchup if they do it but I don't think well, as many I people think... left for T.I. because he doesn't yeah, T.I.'s already put it out that he doesn't want to go against anybody in the 90s so he but already also, limited himself but, but also too like, I want them to start thinking about it on a deeper level. Like, I like the Snoop Dogg BMX thing because there's the dog comparison, but that's yeah. the only stylistic thing that went on, and that still went off really well, even though the music stylistically was totally different what they were bringing to the table. You feel what I'm saying? Right. They were able to blend it and make it work. It felt like more of an effort, a production, a show, what you're actually saying that it is. And what I'm looking for is that because that's how you pitch this shit. That was fun. You know? No violence or nothing. I mean, you know, shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think that with T.I. and Wayne, I think that that would be a good matchup. But again, how many people, I mean, let's just say it like like it is. How many That's people so is T.I. Yes. going to decline? You know what I'm saying? Like, he's got to respond to this Ross thing. Ross put it out there. Buster Rhymes called him out. He said you know, no. I like it. I like it better when you're being disrespectful to these Atlanta rappers without wearing like Atlanta paraphernalia on <laughs> like you're doing now. It just comes off much better. No, nah, I did this for a reason like, tonight. Oh, I, I want to oh, talk man. to Atlanta. I want to talk to my Atlanta MCs, you know. But yeah, I mean, how many people is he going to decline? Let's just be real. I mean, you don't think he should have went up against Buster Rhymes? Buster Rhymes called him out. You don't think T.I. would have had a chance? Because a lot of people, I know we put it on the page, a lot of people felt like T.I. would beat Buster Rhymes. I don't think he would. But the more, time, the more time that continues to go by, the more time I tend to lean, lean towards your favor. Like, who won it with Buster, period? Period. Dot, 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 dot. So, the thing like, is, though, T.I. can't go out there asking for verses. And when people jump up, just not take them, and then when the because no, honestly, country. Jeezy jumped up in this situation, didn't he? Did he not? Jeezy was Mike, the one that came for it. Mike, these matters in hip hop they happen expeditiously, you know. <laughs> Who do? You, let me ask you this before we go on to talk about Jeezy's new album, which you know came out at midnight. Um, who? What do you think happened in this whole Jeezy and Ti versus? Who do you think switched things around? Do you think, A, T.I. backed out and uh, went and got Gucci as the replacement? Or B, do you think that, you know, Jeezy went out there and said, you know what, I want to do this against Gucci? Or C, do you think Swiss and them just say, you know what, T.I., you're out, Gucci, you're in? Like, what do you think happened? So, Mike, I, I think that I'm glad that you asked that question. This is unrehearsed between you and me like it always is. Yeah, yeah. And that's about... It's that's real about, nigga this talk. Is about to, this is about to be a great segue because I actually wanted to get into that and therefore into the album because I feel like Jeezy pulled a lot of strings about this versus and about connecting it to this album, which is his best project in a while, which we're about to get to. Because, uh, quite frankly, he, like, he hears the shit that people are talking about him in the streets, which is pretty much saying, you know, stick a fork in him. He's done. And so, you know, where you may be on the stance of actually thinking that um, the T.I., you know, chose to remove himself or bow down again, I actually think Jeezy kind of took this by the reins. And it's like, you want to know what? Nigga's been out here saying that I'm done. Niggas, you know, the whole Gucci thing's still up in the air, and he's just out to go ahead and put all that shit to bed, I think, before he really, like, transitions into, like, his uh, true, like, James St. Patrick shit. So this is kind of like uh, some Godfather 3 shit. You know what I'm saying? I would be inclined to agree. I I would be inclined to agree, except for the fact that we all know T.I. has a huge ego. And him being removed from anything without it being his choice, I'm sure we would hear about it. Mike, it would be on a live or something. 
Mike, nobody better than maybe T.I. knows how important it is for Gucci and Jeezy to get on the stage together and step yeah. off the stage together without anything of the violent nature happening. So right. big in his ego may be, I think his relationship with Jeezy is as such, possibly, and that his overall uh, Atlanta uh, spokesman and representative type of status here, he's probably looking at it like big homie, bigger picture, and like, no, nah, let me let my partner like handle the business that he need to handle because I still am who I am at the end of the day down here, and he is. So. He did say on the Expeditiously uh, podcast when Jeezy was on there, they were talking about all three of them getting together and squashing whatever, and it was mostly about you know, T.I. wondering what needed to happen between them two to get them set down. So he, he has put it out there that that was important. But I will say this. I do think that T.I. needs to go ahead and do a versus against somebody else. And honestly, man, 50 Cent couldn't have been the only person on your radar. Like, you got to... He believes in his catalog. And I know even when he called out 50, he did say... Eminem, Dr. Dre, or whatever. We all know the Dr. Dre thing is a stretch. Nobody wants it with Dr. Dre. I think that's the only person that's damn near unbeatable. Dr. Dre and Snoop or whatever. Or whatever combination that is. But he's going to have to do one now. And with Ross putting it out there, that's going to have to be the one. I don't see him backing down from the Ross thing. Uh, Andre... Uh, Shasir says, Jeezy's comment at the end saying, Nas and Jay-Z, y'all better watch out. Had me confused. Y'all know what that's about? Have no idea what that's about. I don't see Jay-Z doing this. Um, I honestly, you know, I think Jay-Z would wax Nas in a situation like this. But we're not going to get on that. <laughs> ah! He would. Sorry. <laughs> so what did you think about the recession too though? I really enjoyed it. <clears throat> I thought a couple of interesting things about Jeezy today actually like when I listened to it for the second time. You know, everybody has something that, that makes them kind of special on the mic. Mm -hmm. I've always looked at Jeezy in the same way that I've kind of looked at Fat Joe, a guy that kind of came from the streets and was really more of a street dude than a rapper at first. Right. And actually... Uh, morphed himself into an above average rapper that actually could put on uh, tracks with top notch level MCs. Right. And he belonged there. And I feel that way about Jeezy. But what I think is really important about Jeezy that's very misstated because he doesn't do it often is, is that nobody that's really lived the life that Jeezy has really lived out here, because like he is one of the guys that has lived this lifestyle that so many of these guys say that they've lived, it's like totally not authenticated the way that his is to a degree. And he talks about things on a socioeconomic level mm -hmm. and in a manner and with the truth that none of his contemporaries who talk about the hustling game the way that he does ever has. And he's special in that regard. And it's even more special because, to be honest with you, Mike, he's really only done it on the recession and the recession, too. But the depth and the quality of his thoughts and delivery of them and beat selection when he is in these thought processes of, like, executing these uh, content-driven album goals is pretty startling for a guy who's you know, favorite two projects for me personally are named Trapper, Trapper Dive Volume 1 and 2. Um, you know? Do you have the and track so list in front of you? And I do want to ask people, you know, if y'all have heard the album, uh, Jeezy's new album, The Recession 2, uh, what are some of your favorite songs on the album? I'm about to put the track list up here, though. Um, what were some of the standout tracks to you? Uh, I'm Like You, Praying Right uh, was probably my favorite track. Okay. Uh, the Glory fe featuring Neo, The Glory. Okay, so some people just have chemistry together where every time they get together, it's going to go well. And The Glory with Neo is probably like the fourth or fifth track they've done together where I've been like, damn it, Mike, y'all should just 
make records together as long as you can because every time they do a record together, I find myself within the record being like, damn, that was a really good record, whether it's on Neo's album or on Jeezy's record. I didn't yeah, love so the Marvin Gaye sample. That was the one with the Marvin Gaye sample, right? And, 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 and I'm funny, I kind of funny about that, you know, sometimes too with, with the Marvin samples, you know? Right. Um, Niggas was a, was a, was a, was a poignant track that I thought stood out. Modern Day, Stimulus Check, Almighty Black Dollar, and, King, and The Kingdom. Those were the standout tracks to me. There weren't a lot of missteps on here. And, and here's what I mean when I mean, <clears throat> so guys that have made their living in this game, talking the way that Jeezy's talk and being the way that he is, conceptually can't put together projects like this usually that are outside of their realm and still talk the way that they talk, but still actually make it about the theme of the album. And here's what I mean when I say the theme of the album, because I wanted to reference this. It's him standing next to, like he, this is 70s black exploitation damn near, or black power, like the, the cover of the album. Yeah. Mike. The track selection the track selection is the same way. He's consistent. He's painting the picture from the cover of the album to the beats that he's picking to the content that he's covering. Most dope boys don't do that shit, Mike. Uh, because they can't. No, because they can't, Mike. And that's what I'm saying. So even if people don't totally enjoy the record or feel like the content's recycled, redundant, or they're just tired of Jeezy or if it feels uninspired, understand people that do what he does, oh, they can't do this like as in, like, none of them, Mike. What do you feel like, uh, what do you feel about uh, the Demi Lovato feature? Mm, mix, mix signals. Yeah. Mix signals. Uh, that was definitely for the radio. And what about, what about the therapy for my soul? Let me ask you about that, because I know we put that out, um, uh, what was that, Tuesday or Wednesday. What did you think about therapy of my soul, calling out Freddie Gibbs and... Coach K and 50 Cent and all that stuff. I didn't listen to it until today. I mean, okay. until today, actually, even though I know it came out a couple of days ago. And, you know, I've seen all the posts that everybody got circulating about it, even Gibbs and all that. Right. Um, what part you want me to address first? Uh, um, Therapy for my soul. I mean, like, what part of it? That's what I'm saying. Uh, like, well, I mean, we can start at the 50 Cent part because, uh, I mean, no one even knew, including 50, seems like, that there, there was even a problem there. And, and where does that problem even come from? I was actually thinking the same thing, too. But then I was thinking, like, 50 actually, like, talks a lot. Has he said something along I, the way? Because that's what I mean. And I, I'm, I'm going to tell you what, like, Jeezy's been somebody that's been remarkably steady. Like yeah. in the sense that when he was out, when he was at his peak, Mike, like he didn't talk much. Right. He didn't say, you didn't hear from him much. And as he's been in, I guess what, I mean, no, 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 we're going to call it what it is. The last few years, for sure, he's been in decline. Mm -hmm. But he's been, listen, he doesn't say, like he hasn't upped his press or like anything or try, you know what I'm saying? He's been kind of like steady on whatever his grind and his hustle is and staying quiet about it, mostly the way that he always has. That's why the real estate line was like a real shock. Like, he, he's not one of the dudes that goes down here and talks about the stuff that he owns usually. Right, right. And, and, and from what I understand, he has a lot of ownership in a lot of places that he doesn't even speak about because he wants the businesses to actually live on their own and not, you okay. know, off of his name. Right. Or, you know, some places well, might even get a backlash because they have his name on sure. it. But, but, um, but he's a very observant dude, so it made me think, has 50 said something at some point? Because, you know, 50 jokes a lot. You know, 50 will say, you know... Like, like, 50 might have, like, if 50 heard some of his verses from a couple of years ago in guest appearance, he might be like, oh, this nigga trash, you know, throw him in the... 50 might have said that. That's not out the realm. Well, so, he called him trash the other day. Well, he said, yeah, shit is trash. I mean, no, uh, he probably he probably said something about it before that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. And Jeezy's probably been in the cut watching, and Jeezy's probably... Jeezy's in a mode right now, and you can even tell from the album selection, like, there's not a lot of guest rappers or guest appearances. He took on this project by himself. Like, most rappers that are in decline in people's eyes, that are as long as he is in the game, they don't take on a project like this. Like, this is less guest appearances than T.I.'s project, Busta's project, Nas's project, Big Sean's project. Like, he took the weight of this album on by himself, too, and I think he did that intentionally to show people, like, that he still has it. He can put together an album that's consistent, content-driven, 
good beat selection. He can address his adversaries and his issues. And and I'm and, and I'm telling you, and it's like we probably don't have to dig it up because Fifty does talk a lot and tweet a lot and like or, or I guess Instagram a lot. I don't know because I don't follow Fifty, but. Fifty probably said something that prompted that was my initial thought, even though we can't immediately recall what it is. Do you think that Fifty's uh, involvement in the BMF uh, documentary has anything to do with it, and the fact that he's been working with uh, Meech's family to get that done? You think that has anything to do with, um, I guess, Jeezy feeling on, somewhat 50 slighted? Cents Fifty cents involved. Yeah, BMF 50's doing the BMF documentary. He's doing the... Who's it? Like, is he executive producing it? Did he, like, buy the rights? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did like, people handle the project? Yeah, uh-huh. But he bought the rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's working with the family to do it. No, 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 no. But, I mean, like... Yeah, he bought the rights like, to do it. Like, he's he doing it. He's doing the project? Yeah. He's doing the project? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, too. Um, speaking of those other albums that were, you know, a little bit more feature heavy, where do you rank the recession with um, with T.I.'s project and with uh, ELE2? Um, it's not as good as ELE2. I mean, we had ELE... I mean, you think ELE2 is better than King's Disease. I don't agree, but I have it right after King's Disease. Um, when I actually thought about this album, when I was done listening to it the second time... I thought about Jada Kisses Ignatius, yeah. Benny, uh, B- Benny with a Burden of Proof, and T.I. with the Libra. Those were the three albums that came to mind to me. Do you think it's better than any of those that I mentioned? I think T.I.'s Libra and this one are very comparable just structurally. Um, you know, this one had uh, um, um, uh, Tamara, yeah. Ma- uh, yeah, Mallory at the beginning, T.I.'s had it at the end. You know what I'm saying? It was like, yeah. Tamika Mallory was at the beginning of this one, and huh? I'm glad you I'm glad you brought Ti up because I thought that of those albums that I just named, and I mean maybe it's like you know Southern thing versus East Coast thing in that regard, and only in this regard. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing: the lesser MC took on more weight and had less help and made a comparable project. Doesn't that make the project better? Because Tips the superior MC mm-hmm. and, and had more help. The albums are comparable. Jeezy's the lesser MC and had less help. Doesn't that make it better than the Libra? I'm, I, listen, I'm not mad at that assessment, honestly. I mean, I'm really not mad at that because, assessment. Because, because we have to weight it based also, too, when you start, when you, when albums get comparable, you have to start thinking, well, who's the guy spitting on the mic? And T.I. is a superior MC, so if the album are comparable and T.I. has more, way more features, specifically rap features in particular, like Jeezy's the voice of this album. I was you talking know, to my man. guy Brandon today, man, and Brandon has great insight on a lot of records, man. And you got to get Brandon on the show at some point. Shout out to him. And he was talking about uh, Libra, like it sounded like a lot of these songs. Not saying this happened or whatever, possibly could have belonged to the artists that were on them. And, you know, T.I. puts a verse on there, it's my song, let me get that from you. And so, saying all that to say, whether it happened like that or not, you're right. It's like, you do got to give more points for the person that went out there and basically set their own soundtrack where we don't know how these records, because let's be real, the records that are on Libra, they sound more like the person that's on the feature, and it's like T.I.'s on it. You know what I'm saying? I don't totally T.I. Agree didn't bring that. everybody into his world. Like, does no. Ring sound more like a T.I. record or a Young Thug record? But Young Thug dominates records, you know? Same thing with oh. Lil Baby. Like, Okay, see, but I can say that about Volume 2 with Jay. That's what I mean. It's like, of course. Is, 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 is that those people's songs? Or is Jay really brilliant at, bring, at, at, at meshing into people's worlds? And so I think it might be a little bit of both. But what I am saying is, is that... I thought the recession two was a comparable album. It had less help. I personally, just because I love that '70s style production, enjoyed the production more. The production Even was though- on point. I will say that, and you know, I'm not a okay. huge fan of Jeezy as a lyricist like that. Uh, I do think that his perspective has always been one of the things that was his strong point. 
I think he really takes a lot from conversational Jay. I think he takes a lot of the reasonable doubt approach when it comes to speaking to his audience. And I think that really good production helps him out a lot in that situation. And yes, this was a very well produced album. And I was impressed with that. Justice League did that thing when they got on their spots too. And so so it's well produced. Song sequence and structure is good. Uh, he, he's tight on this album, Mike. I mean, he may sound uninspired at times. And, and there are some missteps track-wise. But for the most part... He does his job as an MC. It's not like you're, you're not listening to Jeezy's album for him to wow you with bars anyway. Mm-hmm. And also, too, you know who else I thought about today when I got done listening to this for the second time? I was like, this is why, like, this is this is part of the pr- reason why an album might like pray for Paris by West Side Gun, who is somebody that's not traditionally considered to be a great upper echelon MC or lyricist, I guess, by a lot of heads per se, can be in contention for the album of the year because it's like it's. And, and you know, Mike, how I feel about lyrics and rhymes, but it's still not all about that when it comes to putting a project together. And Jeezy is somebody that, whether it's a mixtape or an album, has proven that he can put good to great projects together. Because it's like, for me, this, for me, is his fifth overall effort that I can say no. That's a pretty good to great album. And the other two are mixed, t- two of the five are mixtapes. That would be Trapper Die 1 and 2. And then I would say 101, 103. Actually, I'm sorry, Mike Six. 101, 103, the recession, and then this. And so this does something for him catalog-wise, I feel like, too. Do you think there are any real standout songs on here that are really going to, um, I guess, move the needle in his catalog? If we were doing the greatest hits from Jeezy, um, do you think any of these records would make it? I mean... Not necessarily, but I could say the same thing about Nas and Busta's album and T.I.'s album. And you know what I'm saying? I don't think any of those guys necessarily made any tracks that the going on their greatest achievement. And those are great albums. And and in Busta and Nas's case, and much like with this case probably, this is probably the fourth or fifth best album. And, and none of this stuff is probably going to make it. We'll see how it holds. I think... Right. Um, I think the glory with Neo and the almighty black dollar with Rick Ross stand the best chances long term of doing that. When I hear those records, I like those records. Like there are a couple tracks that stand out more right now, but when I hear those two records, I can hear that I'm going to be listening to those records the longest off this project possibly. So we'll see how they hold up. Okay. But I mean, this is also a guy, you know, like, Jeezy is one of those guys that came along when hip hop had become the money making and marketing machine that it could be. Mm-hmm. And him part of that machine, he's one of those guys that has a lot of hits because of that machine, a la T.I., the game. Yeah, Ross, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kanye, I mean, Drake. And so Ross. it's like, it's a lot to ask. So it's a lot to ask to say, oh, is this going to make their greatest hits catalog? Well, your greatest hits catalog is usually only going to be like 15 to 20 songs. And so it's like, it's. Is there supposed to be one of his 15 to 20 best songs on this record? Like, well, you know, I, I guess I'm so. asking because, you know, it's like uh, like when Jay, even though this was like 10 years ago now, but when Jay came with Blueprint 3, he was able to, you know, come through with the Empire State of Mind. I mean, and I guess we don't see that happen in hip hop a lot where guys... Was, Hold on. Go ahead. I wouldn't put anything on the Blueprint 3 on Jay's Greatest Hits. and I love You got to put Empire Three. State of Mind on. Album. I no, think I you got to put anything. Empire State of Mind like, on. Them. Hold on. You want to know what? Maybe Run This Town makes it, but Empire State of Mind is not a great record, Mike. Really? Not, you don't think it? I, I, I will say this. I will give you this. I will give you this, Cool. I don't even think it's one of his 30 best songs, Mike. I think it's important. I, I, I think it's important. I agree with you. I don't think that Empire State of Mind has had the legs that maybe people would have hoped it had. But I think it was a very important record and a huge record when it dropped for a person that was at that point in their career. You know, that's his first number one single? That's crazy. I no, no, I feel you. I don't care about that stuff either. But I'm just saying, I think that's incredible. To have a career like that and that late in your career have really your first number one single. Um, I mean, we just don't see that I, often. No, I, I get it. But if we're talking about like, okay, so for me, when you say, uh, 
for me, even when you say greatest hits, it's like, nah, like, yeah. I want your best shit. I want your best shit. And it's like Empire State of Mind isn't his best shit. But Run This Town, just the way they put that record together. What about DOA? Like, huh? DOA. I mean, no. No. I think DOA is the best record on Blueprint 3, honestly. No. You don't I mean, think Mike, so? Actually, the best record on Blueprint 3, actually, to me, is already home with Cuddy on the hook. That's a good record. Uh, I like Thank You, too. But, yeah. I like Thank You. Thank You's funny to me. That's like old Jay that used to just like have fun when he used to take shots at people. That's like imaginary player Jay as a grown man. It really is. That yeah, is that's, subliminal, that's, that's, conversational that's, Jay. That's Thank You is like imaginary player part two. It's like he doesn't pull up in Brooklyn anymore. He pulls up into the Barclays. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's I really liked American Gangster, Gangster for that too. I think he did a really good job of kind of being the older version of Reasonable Doubt on American Gangster. No, it's a great album, Mike, but it's like, heck, Mike, with all artists and not just rap artists, when you hear their greatest hits, what you're really hearing is the best stuff from their best two or three albums and a couple of tracks from the fourth. Rappers are no different. Yeah. You hear Jay's greatest hits, you're going to hear Reasonable Doubt and Blueprint shit. You hear Nas's greatest hits, you're going to hear It Was Written in Illmatic shit. Like... And what? maybe lost tape stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, so what are you giving the Jeezy out of a five? Uh, I kind of want to give it a... I'm, no, no, not kind of. Like, I'm going to give it a four because it's like... I think it's better than Kiss's album and T.I.'s album. I'm not sure if it's better than Benny's album. And I had Benny at four. Hmm. But I Right there. But I don't think it's better than Benny's album because... Benny's highlights are way better than the highlights of this album. And so this is like a lower end four to me, kind of like the way Kiss's album was or the way T.I.'s album was. Like Benny's to me, like Benny is my strong four for this year. It's like, you want to know what I think a four is? It's like Benny's album was a four. And Benny, I think that, you know. And I have, and I have Benny's album, I think, right next to like Sean's album and Lil Baby's album. Like, so it's. I think Sean is the most solid four out there. Um, I, I, I think, I think Benny's Sean, album was kind of underwhelming. Well, I think Sean overachieved. Objectively, I think Sean's album is better because he overachieved and Benny may have underachieved, mm-hmm. but I prefer listening to Benny's project. But that's aesthetically what I prefer to listen to. Right. Well, what did you think about Megan's uh, debut album? Megan The Stallion finally dropped her... Well, she had mixtapes. We got Tina Snow. You got Fever that came out. What was that, last year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, last year. And then she dropped Sugar earlier this year. But the official debut album of Megan Thee Stallion, uh, Good News. What was your first reaction with listening to Good News for the first time? It was harder to enjoy this album because Armani Caesar has come along and given me another female voice to listen to that does what I would say comparable work or material. That was my initial thought after listening to the project. My second thought was was that Megan is somebody that, I mean, you remember in the club video where Fifty Cent's being put into the machine? Mm-hmm. Nobody very nobody symbolic. Better than Megan does in recent memory. Like, remember when they were literally putting Fifty in the machine and showing literally him, taking this Hank King and putting him in the machine? Yep. It's like when I <laughs> when I heard good news today, I was like, well, damn, they just put her. All the way in the machine. Yes, samples you know, and all. And, and Mike, and you know how I feel. I don't like that happy shit. Well, see, with her, and you know, I, I think we talked about this offline. Um, you know, there's some standout tracks though. You could tell what's the singles on there. Uh, well, first of all, I want to go off. Of, I want to start off with the intro, "Shots Fired." I guess you want to call it the intro, the first song, uh, where she basically took you know the Biggie track. For who shot you? Flip the sample the same way. It's damn near the same track. Um, I don't like. That. Don't take that track. <laughs> I don't like that either. Uh, right. That's big. That record. And I don't I mean, feel I'm, like that. On, you know how you know how great who shot you is. Jay Z said that's the last hip hop record he heard that really excited him and made him want to go in the booth and rap. Think about that. Separate the weak so, from the ops. Leak hard to creep the Brooklyn streets. It's all, nigga. Fuck all that bickering beef. I can hear sweat trickling down your cheek. Your heartbeat sound like Sasquatch feet. Thunder. Shaking the concrete. The dude was just crazy. 
Get, so it's hard for me to hear anybody rhyme over Biggie shit. And I don't want to sound like I'm shitting on Megan or anything. Because you know what? The last person that actually did something that I couldn't even shit on was when Ross did that. Nobody. Nobody that somebody kills you over. I was totally against it. Shit was fire. Mike, I wasn't a fan of that either, and I'm still... I'm not mad at you for that. I'm not mad at you for that. Because to me, that song is sacred in so many ways because that was really Biggie's last record. Last record on the last album, and it's so eerie. But it's one of his best records. One of his best records. It is. That's a top ten Biggie song. There are a lot of people that feel like that's his best song. It's up there. It's up there. It's easily a top ten. No, it's easily top ten. It's easily one of his ten best songs. But let me rewind to Megan, though. So So when people... Go ahead. (laughs) Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your Biggie thoughts. We can nerd out on Biggie all day. You know that. It's like, stop it. Like, stop that. Like, don't take who shot you. Don't take niggas bleed. Don't... don't, Like, no. But see, this is where we're at, though, right now, Coop. We're in an era... I don't want to hear you do kick in the door. I don't want to hear you do unbelievable. I don't want to hear you do machine gun funk. This is where we're at, though, bro. Like, we're in an era where people are remaking... Don't do it. People are remaking these records. I think we were talking about a record. It was on the Buster Rhymes. I think it was the One Love. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Not One Love. Yeah, The World Is Yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was The World Is Yours. People had a problem with Buster doing. Except for Pete Rock has actually produced that record for Buster Rhymes who produced The World Is Yours. And And Rock Rock Him. No, I feel you. I feel you. (laughs) It's Rock Kim rapping. We ain't handing out hall passes to Rock Kim over the world. It's like, what are doing? So, so let's get this straight. Maybe ah. it's the rap over the who shot your beat, but Rock Kim doesn't get the rap over the world is yours beat. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> well, see, I think Megan doing that girls in the hood with the boys in the hood thing. We talked about that when it came out. Um, doing the who shot you. I think she had the Adina Howard Freak Like Me uh, sample with the Scissor record. Uh, it's another one on there that's just just so blatant. It's like, I don't think she needs to do that. We've heard Megan put together oh. real notable records that have their own identity because it's very hard, damn near impossible, for artists to have their own identity when you're rhyming over these records. Those songs can't have their identity anymore. That that's that shots fired. So, that's who shot you. That's not shots fired. It'll never be. So who? So 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 here's what I have to submit about all that. My two biggest takeaways for the album. The first one was was that outside of a record or two, literally, it seems like all the standout records are with a male counterpart. I don't like that look for her, and that's one of those things that made me think about Armani because I'm thinking like, damn, Armani sounds great next to great MCs and great by herself. It's real hit or miss when you don't pair her with somebody. Um, and, and, and and her hit, I mean, I, I don't know what you would call it. It's like, I mean, how much of, it, of a hit is it? Like, I know it's a hit technically like to Billboard, but how much is a hit in terms of like, who's really like playing that record? And so, and also too, it's like has a dude. It's like Mike, and and I don't even know who it was. I think it was Sam J that kept coming up on here pumping like Armani shit. But it's like yeah. as a dude, you can ride to Armani shit. You feel what I'm saying? Like as a guy, you can ride to Armani shit. I'm like, gonna be honest, and you know, shit. It, like like Mike, I, Mike, you don't remember what sample it was because nobody does. Because by the end of the amp album, I was lost in how many samples she used, like in how many like relevant samples a guy used. It's like it was like. It was like relevant sample overload too, and that's what I mean about her being in the machine. It's and here's what I mean. I'm about going the to the track list right? now. Go for it. Now keep going. My bad. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, when you put somebody into the machine and you take all these samples, it's like this person has to do numbers and move units, and it's like I didn't hear records that were going to do that for her that I hadn't already heard. You know what? I, I I look at that different, and you're right. I mean, obviously, it's money poor. Right now, Mike, where's she gonna eat at? Like, 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 this gotta move, yeah. move, and then look a lot of samples, a lot of like relevant, prevalent, like high dollar samples. It's like she gotta do some numbers. Ain't no show money out here right now. I mean, like, am I missing something? Well, I mean, she does have. I mean, if we're talking money, right? She does have the Fashion Nova <laughs> collection that just uh, launched it. So like 1.2 million 
in like the first hour or something. But you got to know that the label, I mean, let's be real. She's probably in the 360. I don't see any label signing any uh, artist Mike, in a... In, Mike, she won't. She better have a line popping, Mike. She might end up owing them a couple mil off this joint. No, 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 no. I mean, listen. Let's keep it real. At this, I, I know a lot of artists don't like to admit they're in the 360 because of how it looks. But no label's going to sign anybody and put money behind you without a 360 at this point. Because how are they going to get their money? Ain't no shows. Right. So everything's endorsement. They got to get a piece of all that. But I'm saying, what it sounds like to me with these high price samples and these... I, I want to call them like cheat code records, right? You know, cheat. you they know the certain records. these records are proven. Freak like me is proven. Um, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Boys in the hood is proven. Who shot yeah. you is proven. We heard a lot of other ones in there that were proven as well. It lets me know that the label is not willing to take a chance on you creatively going out there creating your own shit. They're gonna go out there and say, "Look, we need a for sure hit." So. We're going to basically get you on these records that have already been proven. It's like a coach not really trusting, you know, their quarterback to throw the long ball. You're trying to dink and dunk it so you can go ahead and get yardage. Boom, boom. Let's get in here real quick. That's how so, I looked at it. So, Mike, here's how fucked up the game is when you're talking like like a, in a disparaging manner about the 360 deal. I talked to a major producer down here this year in Atlanta and another producer in Charlotte this year that's actually fairly major in his own right and been nominated for some things. And both of them told me, like, literally just like this, and they don't know each other, but they pretty much said the same thing to me, which is pretty much like, niggas will murk somebody out here for real for a 360 deal. That's how fucked up the game is right now. So it's like, even if she does have a 360 deal, it's sad to say she's actually still in an advantageous position as opposed to most artists right no, now. No, it's not. Listen, it's nothing wrong with the 360 deal. Honestly, it depends on what you want. Cause at, at, no, no, no. There's a bunch wrong with it, Mike. It's the standard, man. Standard. Like, at the end of that the day. Standard, Mike? No. It no, is. That's not a standard. That's, no, that's fucking highway robbery. That's some bullshit. It's what right? it is. I mean, uh, how, listen, Chris, listen, Chris, Coop, you're the record label. Think about it. it. It's that way because who said so, though, Mike? The well, people who are the way? people who are cutting the check, right? And and the public is not yeah, buying records. Trust them with our product. No, I'm just saying the public's not buying records, yeah. huh? Let me ask you this. We'll, we'll we'll get off of this real quick, but let me ask you this: You are let's say Def Jam for you know whatever reason. All right, you believing in the artist, you signing that artist. They want an advance. You want to go all in on them. And you know you got to put money in the marketing, pushing and yada yada. How are you going to get your money back? You, they're not going to get them off of records like we used to. So you have to get your money back from shows, hooking them up with certain uh, deals when it comes to the festivals they're going to be on. You have to get your money back in swag. You have to get your money back in uh, endorsement deals that you set up as a label that you put them in position to get. I mean, I was talking to Kwame. I think he was saying that, you know, a lot of these labels have, they have turned their whole marketing floors into nothing but swag shops. They're, they're selling clothes. You know what I'm saying? All like, say, Mike, all I got to say is for all the young and up and coming artists, Google Strange Music, Google Griselda. Yeah. Do that shit. The rest of this shit, Mike, stick up. I feel you. But the the name, but <laughs> to those artists as well, you got to understand that you're going to have to have some co capital behind you to do what those guys did. And so the guys that are out here signing these deals to the majors, they want the advance. And even that goes even to back in the day, where it's like Master P was like, look, I don't need the advance. I'll put this money up. We're going to do this 80-20, and we'll handle the marketing. Where T.I. was like, you know, because when he had this conversation with P, T.I. was like, I wanted the advance. That's why his deal was different. But see, the difference now is if you want that advance, the label's like, how are we going to get our money back? And the only way they can get their money back is through endorsement deals, through your shows, and through swag. The Man. CDs aren't even a factor anymore. <laughs> We be out here laughing at these rappers, Mike, when we be out here. Whatever. I'm um, just saying. I mean, 
the the situation is you either I would imagine the labels like you either sign a three sixty deal or you go do your thing somewhere else. I mean, because really, how can they even put money into you when they can't get them back through music? Streams don't pay. And don't look. You, you see what I'm saying? Like, how are they going to get their money back without putting you in the 360? No, not, hey, Mike, Mike, <laughs> every, no, everything that you're saying is game and fair game to a degree, but the game sour like a pickle bee. But I think the other part of it, too, and the way people would justify it in their mind is the fact that, okay, well, they got me in the 360. They're going to make sure I get these endorsement deals because they're eating off of it. They're going to make sure I get toys because they're eating off of it. They no toys right now. Well, yeah, you know. But right now, that's why, like we said this before, the major artists, they ain't coming out with albums. We could tell who's in 360s right now because ain't no tours. That's what I mean. That's what's so, like, that's the, these are the points that I'm making about her dropping with these samples and, and like, you know, the deal that she most likely is in, which is the 360. Well, I, I think that I are maybe be- eat, are you gonna really eat off of this and like win off of this project? It's like because at at the point of me understanding the game the way that I do, when I got done listening to the project, I wasn't thinking about the quality of the project. I was thinking like, damn, how's she gonna eat off of this right now? Like, you know, eat and win. I used to think that the like is, the goal is to win. Like like the goal is to win and to set up generational wealth for black families because there aren't enough avenues presented to us to do so. If hip hop is one of them that provides it, like let's do it. How the fuck is she gonna get to the money? With the game being fucked up, her being locked in a 360 deal, there being no shows right now, which is where the fucking label and the artist is really eating right now anyway, because like you said, streams ain't paying. So like now at the point I'm done listening to her project and getting blinded by all the samples, I'm like, where the fuck is the dough at? <laughs> I think that the label was going for the for sure uh, money. Joshua Collins says, y'all never on topic. We are on topic. We talking about the samples on Megan's album. But <laughs> you know what? All right. Well, let's sound like we're a little bit more on topic because because part of what makes this fun about what me and Mike do is that it's actually unrehearsed and we actually like delve into things like organically. And so like, you know, like we're a little different. Like we don't like like have no agenda or have nobody forcing us to do shit or talk about certain people or do certain shit. We're doing what the fuck we want to do. So it's like, you know, like enjoy the shit, fam. Like, chime in. Tell me what you think of Meg's album. Yeah, man. But you know what? If we want to talk about Shots Fire, right? I don't think that it should have been a diss record. I think that this is a serious situation that a lot of people have a lot of mixed information about what happened. A lot of unanswered questions. Um, Tory Lanez, well, we're talking about the song Shots Fire where Megan addresses... I don't even want to say addresses Tory Lanez. She basically has a diss record towards Tory Lanez, right? Um... Anyway, I mean, he's already shots like shots were fired at her like verbally and physically. Like, right, like. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, yeah, I mean, we get the metaphor and all that, uh, <laughs> but it's not. A, that's what I mean. It's a metaphor and 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 a real life nuance. I think that Both. the approach. And I said this offline. The approach felt a little clout chasing esque because. Tory Lanez just, well, we don't know when this record was recorded, but he just pled not guilty to shooting her in the foot. What up? That, that's out. What up? I mean, yeah. Did, but didn't his record come, didn't his, this record come off the same way, though? Like, his record. All, that's why I told you, Mike, it's messy. It's all going to come off the It's way messy. All, but honestly, and I'm not trying to defend him. I know it's going to sound like whatever, whatever. His sounded like he was telling his side, right? Which, whether people want to believe his side or not, whatever, he was kind of, he positioned it in a way like he was telling his side. Very kind of industry created is what you're saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. Formulated, it sounds like a formulated disc record as opposed to something that's organically thought and felt based on the situations that happened. Right, right. It felt she's like... In the machine. She's in the machine. Yeah. It felt like, yeah. yeah, let me go with this nigga type thing. She's dissing him like... Yeah, you know that's I mean, you dissing him like she's in the machine because she is that's what i mean it's like even the disc record is like a machine disc record album it's like here's how you formulate and make a disc record when you need to put somebody in check in the hip-hop game i just think it would have been more powerful if she would have just told her side he told his side whatever 
And all she had to do was tell hers. I mean, but again, you know, um, that's why I'm just saying, like, for that to be the first song, and I know he made that the first song on his project as well, but to approach it in a way like it was a diss record came across like you taking advantage of a story in the news cycle uh, as opposed to really expressing how this affected the only, thing, the only thing I would tell you about the clout chaser is it's hard to be the clout chaser when you're the bigger star of the two mired in the drama. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you could, like, but it's you could still hold on, hold on because 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 does dropping his name benefit her truly? Not well, you know, really. Hold on. Does her, but does him dropping her name benefit him potentially? Well, yes. Of so. course, of course, of course. So, I mean, it's so, always going to be clout coming like, from his end. Not, not to knock him as an artist. That's the politics of how the business goes. Right, right. She's in the machine in ways that he's not. I, I mean, I understand that he is independent, and, I believe, and, somewhat, whatever, but which is another interesting topic because I've never ever ever seen major publications have their writers say we're never covering this artist again that's crazy hey, did, you post that? did you post that a couple times this week because i was like yo mike being petty like did you post, post that two times this week about about how she got uh, the artist of the year like when her debut album hadn't even dropped no yet. no no i was posted that one time i think okay. that uh cardi it's b really got heavy. yeah it's certainly heavy oh did it uh-huh. yeah I what? saw it like four or five times this week. <laughs> well, Cardi B like, got woman of the year. I was like, Mike super petty. <laughs> I, I didn't do anything. I was just just reporting the news, man. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man. Um, again, I don't have anything against the way she approached it. I just think it would have been a lot more powerful with this being in the news cycle to approach the record differently. As opposed to it just being a diss record. And the fact that, you know, you use the Biggie track. Obviously, this is about it getting in the mix. Let's be real. Like, DJ's playing I shot Who Shot You and then throwing that in there. Like, we see that too. You know, and... Here's something else I think people are forgetting about diss records. There was a time where a diss record still had to be good enough to make it on your album. And part of the reason why, and, and, and I know this seems like I'm kind of like stepping like way over, part of the reason why I never felt like Hit em Up was a great diss record is because Pac never trusted it to put it on his album. I don't think Hit em Up's a great diss record either. And I mean, I used to feel like when I was... So there's a reason that it's on the B-side to how do you want it and not like on the album is what I'm saying. It's getting recorded in the same time frame. It didn't make the album for a reason because it used to be a time where it's like the disc record had to be dope enough to make the album. It's like, and, and, I, and I'm going to bring up some other people. It's like when you listen to the Blueprint and you listen to Stillmatic, it's like the Ether and Takeover are great records, Mike. They're not the best records on either one of those projects, but they're great records that belong on those projects, even though they're disses. And I can go down the line, drop a gem on them off uh, Hell on Earth with Mob Deep. That al- that was a Tupac disc, but it belonged on the album, though. Let me like, ask you this, and I don't think we've ever... Hold on, and sometimes I feel like with how the game works now, it's like, you know you can just drop that disc. It don't have to be part of the project, and it don't need to be part of the project unless it's like that great of a disc. It's like, Mike, the best disc of the last five years, hate to tell it, might be like, might be back to back. Great. It's not on any album. You think it's better than um, Pusha T's? um, Infrared? No, not infrared, but... um, um, the life of um, uh, Adon, the story of Adon, Ad- Adon. Ad- I feel like Pusha had dissed Drake so much, and I've heard so many of the disses that for me, I take the story of Adonai differently than the casual Pusha T or rap fan will because I'm a big Pusha T fan. It's like there aren't too many Pusha T verses, Mike, that I haven't heard, so I've heard all the disses. You know I know, yeah, so, yeah. So it's different. And this was so like was more of a mainstream, actually, yeah. You know what I was actually thinking about? I was actually thinking, I don't know when it came out. When did Rather You Than Me come out with Idols Become Rivals with Rick Ross? 
Uh, I feel like that might have been. That's. I think that was in the last five years. Um, yeah. Braves brought up uh, Remy. She said Remy has the best disc record. Wasn't a big fan of Sheetha like that. But you know what was crazy? You know what was crazy? No, the Mace record. Fuck what y'all talking. The Mace record was crazy. What Mace record? On Cam. You remember that? The Oracle. No, Mike. The Oracle was crazy. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And I'm not even a Mace fan like that. The Oracle was what? crazy. Because we didn't right. expect it. I ain't even going to... All right, all right. Okay, all right, all right. That's cool. I, I, <laughs> I don't even give guys who play with God play. How about that? Oh, okay. You got... Well, you know what? I'm not a huge Mace fan, but I will yeah. give the Oracle its props. And I never asked you this before, though. Like, what's... Real, what's, like, your I'm favorite... Real, how what? about this, Mike? I'm a real believer actually trying to do better, not actually, like, perpetuating the bullshit. I'm actually, like, trying to leave my bullshit behind. So, like, yeah. I feel you. What's your yeah. favorite hip-hop disc record, though? Like, ever? Like, with top of your mind, like, whenever you hear that, like, what do you think is the best? Favorite or best? Both. It's different. Both, both. Favorite is Ether because... I'm going to tell you a story, and it's not because it's Nas. Oh. I was in Green... No, it is. <laughs> it is. My favorite either. I'm going to tell you why. I didn't say best. I said favorite. Okay. See, I didn't think it was the best. Right. So give me a second. I didn't What's love the beat with Ether. That's just me. I love Nas on there. I didn't love the beat. That was my only Ether thing. The beat on Takeover is way better. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, nobody even knew who Round Bronze was until he, he did Ether for Nas. That beat was always uh, to me, but yeah. It did what it needed to do. That's how I felt about the beat. How about that? Mm -hmm. But it was my favorite record because I'm going to tell you what. That record came out when I was in between moving from Greensboro to Atlanta. And I was in Greensboro when Jay had dropped the takeover and dropped the blueprint. And everybody knew I was a Nas fan. And I was actually talking to the biggest DJ in the city at the time because we were all friends. There was like a crew of us that kind of knew each other. His name was DJ Tuan Love. No bullshit. DJ Tuan Love. And we're in fucking Sam's Club in Greensboro. And like, he's asking me my top five MCs. And it's like, I had Nas in there and I didn't have Jay in there. And he's like, yo, what the fuck is wrong with you? He was like... He was like, Jay's like four already. He's like, nigga, Nas done already fell off. Like, it's done. He's like, it's over for Nas. Fam, he's like, you ain't hear Nostradamus, nigga? Like, like, and Swan's going in on me. And he might have been the most respected hip-hop mind in Greensboro at the time. And he's going in on me. And everybody else around us at the time, like, was like on Jay's. Like, and that's when Jay was the man. I'm oh, not yeah. saying they didn't have a reason to feel that way. But let's not get it twisted. In 1999, 2000, Jay is the man. And it's clear. Oh yeah. But I was like, but I was telling them, I'm like, that's the last guy he needs to fuck with. I'm like, that's the last guy. I'm like, that's the guy that'll do him. Shout and, out and to you for having hope in Nas. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So this is why it's my favorite disc record. So he drops that stillmatic uh disc as I'm leaving Greensboro, and my niggas is like, oh, that's not gonna cut it against the takeover coup. You know what I'm saying? And so I moved down here on 9-11, Mike. I moved down here September 10th, 2001. Mm -hmm. So I moved down here the day before the blueprint dropped. But people who know know that the takeover and the stillmatic disc had already started floating, mm -hmm. I think, by then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But all my dudes up in Greensboro never got to hear Ether with me. Like, I got to catch all the flack. I never got to catch any of the victory. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? So that's why Ether is my favorite disc record. Because, Mike, when I go back to Greensboro, Cause I haven't been back like and seen these guys, but oh Mike, when I get these guys, like I can't wait to get these guys because like because of Ether, I got like a twenty year date with niggas like 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 about like all this shit that they was talking about. Jay <laughs> gonna end up being the greatest MC of all time, and Nas's career was over. They telling me Nas's career was over, and he never had a chance. And woo 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 woo. And now Ether is an adjective that describes what happens to you when you take an L in a battle real bad. I'm going to be honest, man. Before you get to what you think is the bestest record, man, I remember I was sitting on steps in the living room of my parents' house when I heard, I want to say TakeOver. Yeah, it was TakeOver. I was that's like... That's a great record. I was that's a like... Great record. 
I was like, man, Nas is done. I really thought Nas was done. I was Everybody like, because this is after I'm, this is after Nostradamus. We I hated the single Nostradamus. We didn't like the album either, and it wasn't like he had a lot of stuff floating at that time. No floating. Uh, no w- Uchi was out. We didn't like that either. We liked the beat, and then. I liked like, Uchi Wally before Wally, Nas got like, on it. No, no, no. Uchi Wally should have never even floated. He put himself on that record. He did. Push that album. He's not part of the original version. He's not. And, and, I liked the song before he got on it, and when he got on it, I was like, Ugh. It's better without him. It's more organic without him. And I was like, man, I think Nas is done, man. And then when he came with Ether, I was like, that's what's up. I'm happy to, you know, I didn't want to see Nas done. But if you were to ask my honest opinion, I thought he was done. So, yes, that Mike, was a real Mike, feeling. Mike, and Jay Mike. was a giant at the time. Yeah. Mike, at the point that Nas dropped Ether, people need to understand, the only person who was probably bigger in stature in the history of rap, like actively the way Jay was at that point, was Rakim. That's how epic it was. It's like his stature was rock him like, and I'm a Nas fan, and I'm acknowledging that. His Jay was everywhere. Was like in terms of like, that's the fucking man, and everybody knows it, even if other people think like. And you had your guys that like Kane, KRS, G Rap, but it's like everybody knew Rock him was the man, and it's like at that point everybody knew Jay was the man. So it wasn't like David slaying Goliath because Nas is a better lyricist, and it's a battle. Which and that. Mike, so this was the thing that I was telling my guys in Greensboro. I'm like, this is a battle, though. Well, the thing is, what made it uneven was the fact that, I mean, down here, and I know Hot 9-7 was doing this, too, but nobody was playing the H to the Omo, um, you know, freestyle like that. I had to go off Napster and download that. And to me, that was one of the stronger ones in the whole battle. But see, for a lot of people, it didn't exist. So Jay Mike, had that advantage too. Mike, Jay made three disc records total, really. Nas made two, and Nas is two, but disc records are better than Jay two of Jay's three best disc records. Like Does the, Last Real Nigga Alive count as a disc record? No, nah, that's not a disc record. That's just a recount. That's just a recount of like the story. That's just a cheap shot. That's like a little jab. That the ain't gift no and the curse. Right. Fuck that shit. The first should be last. I'm a man's man. A rapper's rapper. G O D S O N. And be none after. I was Scarface. Jay was Manolo. Mike. It hurt me when I had to kill him in his whole squad for Dolo. Mike, to the victor go the spoils. That's a victory lap. That's what you get in victory. You get to make victory laps. That's not a diss. That's a victory lap. Y'all know about my biggie wars. Who you thought kicking the door was for? That's my heart. Y'all still tripping off the Jigga shit. Let me tell you how the first thing. <laughs> that was beautiful. I don't know. I take it as a diss record. It was beautiful. No, it's a beautiful record. But and, and 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 I tell people this all the time. Why I love Ether and why it's such a great diss record, it isn't about what he's saying in the verses. It's like Nas is a lyricist. Nas wrote an epically great hook on a diss record. That you, hook is great. It's two hooks for one. I fuck with your soul for Ether. Will teach you the king who know you not. Got sun across the belly. Lose. I prove you. It's two hooks for one, and it's great. And that's coming from a lyricist who technically doesn't write great hooks. It's like he, he used killed him Jay's. On a hook, actually, he used he Jay's. Him on a hook. He took his shit from him and made a hook out of it, and he made it a two-level hook. That's genius shit. That's that. That's what I was telling the guys in Greensboro. It's like, no, but he shouldn't fuck with Nas because Nas will take your shit, make it a two-part hook, and do something that you can't do on the mic. I've always said that Nas, Nas and T.I. share one trait that I think is huge for them. They do their best work with their back against the wall. And when their back's against the wall... They really perform, and they really come out of themselves. They need to be inspired. So, Mike, so Mike, stop for a second. Mm-hmm. We often judge people who are the greatest of all time about how they perform under pressure and under the most pressure, and when the odds are against them the most, that's why he's my GOAT. He actually performs the best under pressure, and before he was under per, per, under any pressure... He made arguably the best rap album ever. Before he was under pressure, he did that. And when he's under pressure, 
pressure, he performs with astounding results. Like well, Barry his pressure at that play. point was more so life. And I think that a lot of guys well, like, who come Michael through... Nostradamus is whack. <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about Illmatic. I thought you were talking about Illmatic. No. Yeah, I mean, I, I just no. thought the pressure there was just to get out, you know. Um, well, I, I, I will say this. The Blueprint 2, and let's, you know, we don't have to get on the Jay and Nas thing, and I know we did talk about that earlier when we were talking about the verses. I think that the Blueprint 2 album showed me a lot about Jay, especially after Ether, and nobody would even know now, if you weren't around at the time, how hard Ether hit Jay, especially when he came with Super Ugly, and especially when, you know, Hot 97, who was basically his. His cheerleaders, for lack of a better term. Co yeah, co-signers. Co co-signer. <laughs> fixing the votes, whatever. You know, they were fixing the votes and all that, the mail-in ballots, yada, yada. But, I mean, he responded with the blueprint, too. And really, that showed me a lot about him in a way where he didn't make the blueprint as far as songs or whatever. But the way he was rapping on the blueprint, too, he had hunger back, you know, and Hovey Baby, and I mean, Jay spit some of his best rhymes, like Seven Straight Summers critics might not admit it, but nobody in rap did it quite like I did it, did it, I done it before, you get it, I had it, got mad at it, and don't want it no more, that goes from everything, from flipping that raw, flipping horse, flipping vocal cords, don't get it twisted, did it right, did it better, did it different, did it nice, did the impossible, then did it twice, did it right, I mean, he wasn't rapping like Lazy Jay no more. He got lazy on volume three. He got lazy on some moments in the dynasty. But you could see that, okay, I got to go for it. And Mike, yeah, that showed me a lot. Mike, not Mike, Mike, he's had a lot of lazy moments. And I, and I ain't even trying to criticize. Like, he's gotten lazy on the mic intentionally. Right. Like some guys get lazy on the mic because they, and I've always said this about him. Oh, his lazy on the mic is intentional, though. It is. And so his lazy is different than anybody else's lazy because he's such he is such a brilliant mind and such a great MC and is capable of so many things that his dumb down is one of the few intentional dumb downs to his benefit in rap history. And there's still some jewels in his dumb down. No, there's still jewels in his dumb down. I'm not, he's one of the greatest MCs ever, Mike. He's, he's still in my top 10 list. I mean, like I said, most days I have him somewhere between four and seven. You know what I mean? Depending on how I feel. I'm just not in awe of him. Like everybody else is, you know, I have them <laughs> between four and seven, which I think is like appropriate. But I mean, people can tell me that guys are better. I mean, and people can lean on the catalog. I'm going to pull out, I'm going to pull out all the Nas and Scarfaces and Ghostfaces songs and, and tell you that like they made better songs than him, like consistently. Well, you know, I'm a Ghostface guy. So. And yeah. before him, but that's neither here nor there. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I respect what he's done and, and who he is. And he's a and he's influenced so many guys. Like we talked about Ross and Jeezy and Tip a lot. It's like all of those are like those are all Jay Z's uh, 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 lineage tree to me. Of course, like, of you course. Know, yeah. Like he has his own tree now. It's like for me, he always used to be part of like Cool G Rap's tree. But it's like he's become such an entity on unto himself. It's like no, you got to give Jay his own tree because he done spawned off more stuff than even maybe G Rap did. I've always thought that he was Biggie's tree, but Biggie was G Rap's tree. So no, I, no, that's what I'm saying. Biggie is G Rap's tree, and yeah. so is Nas. That's why G Rap's tree is like super important. It's like Biggie and Nas are on that tree, though. Well, yeah. I, I didn't get to your to the best diss record ever uh, for you. You know what I really think the best diss record is. I think it's the bitch in you by common. Wow. Bitch in you by common. No, let me let me give you some context because I'm somebody that thinks about it from context. There are disc records that I enjoy listening to more, but I don't think people remember that Ice Cube was the motherfucking man. And and nobody had ever successfully put any chinks in Ice Cube's armor until Ice Cube dropped the bitch in you. And it came from somebody with very little notoriety, somebody who very little people outside of core hip hop circles knew, and very few people understand that Common's first claim to fame of people actually knowing him is the bitch in you, even over I used to love her in the streets, Mike. Which I'll say this: it was very and surprising, and it took a lot of guts. 
I'll say that. It is because of the importance, because it's like that put him on the map on a whole nother level. He was that he was that little kid from Chicago that made I Used to Love Her up to that point. Like, that's the thing that catapulted him into the hip hop rap's consciousness, actually. It was gutsy. And, and, look, yeah. and look and look at and no, and look at where he is. That's what I'm saying. Anybody else's disc records that's been better, oh well it didn't do for them what the bitch and you did for common. It's like Nas is ether. Like if Nas doesn't make ether, Nas was still one of the greatest MCs of all time who had made one of the best rap albums of all time before ether. Well yeah, MC yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, MC MC Light is still arguably the best female MC of all time before ten percent disc. Mob Beep is still the best hardcore East Coast group group to come out in over a decade when they drop drop a gem on them. You get what I'm saying? Like all these people were who they were, kind of in a sense when they dropped their epic disc records. The bitch in you was Commons coming out party to the streets. I think the, the reason street. why people talk about Ether and Takeover so much, it was like that was one of the first times. Well, one of the first times, but it was just Mike Nigga said you slinging beats. Uh, he said you slinging saint eyes and bean pies in the same sentence. Yeah, Woo! yeah, yeah. He was calling out the hypocrisy. He was, and you know, and it's funny because Cube is my favorite rapper, right? Or one of my favorite rappers. Um, top five for Mine me. Too. Mine too. And so, you know, and it's like those disses were, they were on point. And they were on point, Mike. They were true. <laughs> like, 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 Common was pointing out, like, that's what I mean. Wasn't nobody talking to Cube that way? Like, yeah. you couldn't talk to Cube that way. And people forget, not only couldn't you talk to Cube that way, and not only was he that great as an MC, but niggas was really scared of Cube too. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, 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 like, yeah. Like, and, like, you I know, I, I hear... I hear that Common ran into a lot of friction after that. Um, right. And, you know, Fat Joe saved his life, you know, is what Fat Joe said. But, That's what I'm saying. So, Mike, when you listen to my context, isn't that valid, though? It is. You know, I thought you were going to go No Vaseline. Um, no, Mike, because Ice Cube was the fucking man when he made No Vaseline, and that was part of what made him the man. It's like, no, like, that's victory lap shit. But what's so crazy about No Vaseline I mean, death certificate didn't even need it. He was like, he was like, oh yeah, motherfuckers, I ain't forgot. (laughs) Mike, Mike, okay, so you wrote a hip hop classic with straight out of Compton. You drop a hip hop classic out of America's Moat. You get what I'm saying? What is No Vaseline going? What did it really do? This is the thing with No Vaseline, and I think what makes Ether and Takeover and some of those a little bit more different. And I'll even say uh, I'll, I'll even say Jack the Ripper. What I was going to say about No Vaseline is the fact that his opponent were guys that he wrote for. So the you know what I'm saying? So like the the skill level is like, you know, like you be petty. Like you be petty. You know what I'm saying? It's the truth. It's like let's just say I'm the writer for like first I mean, Ren wrote too, Mike. Yeah, he like, did, but Ren was not cute. Ren, Ren, and okay. respectfully, Ren was not cute. I mean, Mike, very few guys in the history of rap have been Ice Cube. With That's what people. I'm saying. So it's like, I know, like you you know, like when, when um, let's just say like an old, let's say LeBron plays the Heat or whatever. They know LeBron. Yeah. Obviously, there's nothing they could do about it, but he knows them too. And so Cube going against three guys that he knows, like, the back of his hand that he's that much more talented than, and two of them he used to write for, I mean, the learning curve isn't too high for that, to be perfectly honest. And I do think No Vaseline, the way he did it, is probably the, one of the most impressive disc records ever. But I do think that your competition matters, and I think that's why Ether has to be held very high. It went at somebody who's incredibly skilled, who was at the top of his game, at the top of the game, and after Nostradamus. So we got to factor in all those things. No, 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 Mike. I mean, I think Ether is the second best disc record ever. But here's the thing. Ice Cube is very comparable to Jay in terms of stature and status, in fear as an MC and as a God MC around the same time the comments doing the bitch in you. And, and and what I'm saying with that is is that I don't care what anybody says. If you're surprised that Nas made Ether, 
then you didn't listen to Illmatic and it was written like you should. And that's your fault. <laughs> no, 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 that's your fault. And, and here's what I mean when I'm saying that that's not your fault, because here's what I was telling my people in Greensboro. And this is young me, like this 19 year old me. Nas is rooted in the fundamentals of hip hop. The fundamentals of hip hop for MC is what? Battle. The ba- but, you know, what? he he hadn't been no, proven no, in that no, aspect no, no, no. yet. But, yeah. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you how cold it is. Nas Low Key told you not to fuck with him on uh, Watch Them Niggas. He was like, that's why I hardly kicked the bragging rap I zone to each his own in this ghetto inhabitant. Like, when niggas is talking like that, it's mean like, like you don't want me to spit that shit. Because if I spit that shit, fam, I'm going to fade you. Because this is the dude that when he did spit like that was saying you couldn't catch me in the street. Without a ton of reefer, that's like Malcolm X catching the jungle fever. When I was 12, I went to hell for snuffing Jesus. Oh, that guy still lives inside of him is what I'm saying. So when you challenge that guy to a battle, no, no, no. When you challenge that guy to a battle, you're going to get the guy that's rooted in those things that made his name by snuffing Jesus and, and having... And having, you know what I mean, having more reef you know what I'm saying? In no, bars, I feel you. I feel you. That guy. <laughs> and and that and that's what Jay got. And it's like, Jay, you're not that kind of rapper. That's not what you're best at. Well, Jay like, comes from the battle guess, arena too. But the oh, thing well, is, like, I think like, that like, do you remember do you remember like the whole thing about the Jay Z DMX battle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, like some people think DMX won and some people think Jay won. Oh, the fact that that was a discussion should let niggas know he wasn't about to fade Nas. But the thing is, man, I think that honestly, on a skill set level, and obviously, however you want to look at it, huh? He got all. They all. They listen. Between the two of them, there are very little tools missing. I do think that Jay Z, being where he was at in his career, and I think Nas hit him really hard. He wasn't expecting a a hit back that hard. And the response, I think, stunned Jay as well. And I think arrogance helped lose that for him. I I think that he had a better record. No, 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 Mike, Mike, Mike. He lost specifically because of his arrogance because he thought that he was that much better. Yeah. Specifically. Because I feel like he had a better record than Super Ugly in him, right? Like, I think no, that... He rushed. He rushed. He panicked. He had never been under that type of duress or pressure, and he didn't perform, so he can't be the greatest. He didn't perform well under his greatest pressure. I think That's that his pressure's a little everybody. different, though. That was the most pressure... No, Mike, that was the most pressure he ever got, and he didn't respond to the pressure with his A game. He responded with some C-plus shit. Hypothetically, and I know there's no way that we could even know. Hypothetically, what if what if the song Blueprint Two was his response instead of Super Ugly? Do we go another round, or I, no? Because because even uh, the Blueprint Two isn't better than the Stillmatic This or Ether, so now I still got him. And also, too, Mike. Hip- Mike, I think it's a proper response when, to Ether, when, though. When, 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 when people tell people, when, when when basketball purists talk and they talk about LeBron James versus Michael Jordan, what do all Michael Jordan purists remind people that say LeBron is better of? What's the one thing they bring up, Mike? Just the clutch? Is that what we're talking about? The clutch, but specifically what clutch moment? Like LeBron had a clutch moment where he really failed at, where he really needed to deliver. What year? Uh, you're talking team? about the Dallas series? Yep. Yep. And so that whole thing with Nas is kind of Jay's Dallas series. You can't be in the conversation when you perform that way under pressure. When you're the man, you're expected to win. You got the team to win. You got the upper hand and everything in your advantage, except you have everything in your advantage, except for the fact that this guy technically is a better lyricist than you. And he totally, like, rails you. It's like, no, you're out. The same way LeBron is out in Mike fans' eyes about it. He's out. Jay He's Jay out. brought up a good point. Welcome to the room, Jay. I know Jay said he got in late or whatever. We covered a lot. Oh, We're like man. an hour and 40 minutes in. We gave you props earlier, Jay, talking about the list. Yeah, I did. We were talking about the list. But Jay said that uh, on the Blueprint 2, Jay admitted that he lost. He did. He, no, 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 no. He said, so in defeat, there's a valuable lesson learned, so it evens out for me. But then he so said, that, 
I got to think the little homie Nas nice for that, though. It's a draw. No, no, no. I heard that sneaky shit, and I remember that bar. No, he didn't say he lost. He said, so even in defeat, there's a valuable lesson learned, so it evens out for me. So what he's saying is psychologically, in my mind, I still didn't lose. And it's like, no, nigga, you lost. <laughs> but you know what? One of my favorite lines in there is that, um, and your little brother Jungle is a garden oh, to me. Like, to me. I remember the bars, Mike. No, he went in. Mike, Mike, Mike. He went in. It just took him about three months to find the gumption to go in, or to find the bars appropriate to go in with it. I don't write it down. Ass. He should have wrote something down. He should have written before. something down. I he think that got him. Down. Yeah, I like, think that got him. What I'm talking about about that pressure, Mike. He does all that bragging, talking about, oh, well, I don't write it down. Guess what? When Nas came for you, should have wrote it down. Should have came it with down. something better. Yeah. Should have came with something sooner. We wouldn't be having this conversation. Everybody that calls him the GOAT, I'm just going to keep on bringing this up over and over again. All right, man. Well, we're at like an hour and 40 minutes. We had a great show today. Uh, we got something real special coming for, uh, you know, the followers or whatnot. You know, Coop and I are putting something together just to wrap up the year and all that. And shit's going to be real live, man. Um, the Liz is definitely going to get his props, you know. And I think that the Liz is better than good news. But I just think that, you know, to wrap it up, I think that Megan didn't really uh, tell us much about herself. Uh, I think that just about every song is about twerking. I, I, I mean, me as a grown man, I just can't listen to all that. And um, it's not my brand of hip hop in that way. I mean, you know, no disrespect. I would give it, I would give it, I guess, a, a three, three and a half. I'm being I tough today. It, I would give it a three. You want to know what's crazy? I don't even know if I told this story last week, but it's like uh, my daughter was on my steps the other day and she was sitting down and like I heard the beat come on and it's like I just heard the style of beat. I was like, oh, that's Meg. Yep. She's like, yeah. I'm like, well, you know, yeah. I kind of work for a in the hip hop, so I kind of know Meg's about the Trump. She kind of looked at me yeah. like, like, oh, yeah, this nigga's up on his rap shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. The baby sounds very similar too. They got a real similar style going on. But yeah, man, we I had a. I thought about that too. Okay, so you you caught that cadence too. I thought yeah. that was very fascinating. Hmm. I think they should do a record together. I mean, like a whole mixtape or something. Like, yeah, like like a little joint venture. Yeah, yeah. I think that'll be real cool. The record, the record came off well. That was one of those records where I was talking about. It's like no, no, no. It sounds really good when she's with somebody though. When yeah. she's got that male counterpart to bounce off of. But with all this, like you know. Uh, oppression and degrading of women for like all these decades in hip hop. I don't want her best moments to be standing next to a man. I want her to be able to stand the next to her, uh, next to a man as well and be able to stand on her own a la a Ginger Ross theme type track off the list. I would like for her to be able to tell her story on her debut album as well because she does have a one a, a amazing story. I mean, Armani, Armani didn't give you no life story shit. You know, it was on some like little one third, one minute, thirty second trailer shit. You know, right, I mean? right, right. The trailers were dope. The trailers were dope. The right. trailers were dope. It's like okay, I'm gonna spend a little money, pay to see the movie next time. Well, I say that about Megan because she has like three mixtapes that you know were obviously kind of like albums anyway. But this is the one where obviously the budget was there. And this was the big fanfare. And this was the moment for the people who hadn't listened to that to be able to tell some of your story. And I hate that we missed that in this one. But I'm not sure what comes out next week. But I know that some people are probably going to be dropping on Thanksgiving. If I don't talk to you before Thanksgiving, man, hope you and your family enjoy that. No, we're going to talk before then. I'm gonna of talk course we are. Some of going on. But hey, you want to know what? This was what I was telling you about, like, our year-end wrap-up, because it's like, I was like, Mike, is anybody else dropping? It's like, oh, well, I don't know. And then it's like, literally, a day after we said it's like, Jeezy started posting the Recession 2 shit. Yeah. And then it started posting shit. And then it's like, Meek dropped the... Meek dropped the four track EP today, and it's like, okay, so the way did you listen to that? Like, we, we're a publication that's supposed to like get the jump, and like we don't even get the jump because the way the game go now, it's like we finding out when y'all finding out. So it's like we're gonna make it do it. Or uh, everybody so, kind of finds out on Wednesday, you know what I'm saying? Then kind of right. prepare for it. Then I think, I think I think next Wednesday we probably gonna have to do a cutoff point for all the behind the scenes stuff. I think so too. Time. I think so too. Did you listen to the Meek before we go? The Meek? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I thought it was trash. I don't want to go that far. I want to listen to it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It was a, a 
you know, I'm going to be honest with our viewers. It was a last minute listen. Yeah. Within the last hour before we went on live, like in my bed while I'm doing a million one different things because I just got home. So it's like I listen to it because I'm like, oh, great. Four tracks. I got like 20 minutes anyway. Nigga, great. <laughs> right. All right, man. Right. Well, um, great show, man. I, I, know I didn't enjoy what I heard, Mike. I didn't. So. I think we kind of went over time, but, you know, I think everybody enjoyed it, and we uh, will be with you guys next week. Well, that's Black Friday. We'll see. I'm sure niggas is dropping on Black Friday. Let's just keep it real. They're going to have to. They're going to have to. Whole pandemic.